Welcome back. You're still watching The Globe on the SABC News Channel. Eastern Libyan commander Khalifa Haftar says that his forces will let oil production resume after an eight-month blockade. And a senior politician in Tripoli said that a committee would be formed to ensure fair distribution of revenues. Meanwhile, Turkey's President Tayyip Erdogan has expressed his disappointment at the announcement made by Prime Minister of the Government of National Accord, Fayez al Sarraj. He's announced that he's uh, intending to step down at the end of October in a speech delivered on state television on Wednesday. The National Oil Corporation, which operates Libya's energy sector, said it would not lift force majeure on exports until all facilities were demilitarized. Tripoli-based Central Bank of Libya says the blockade by Eastern forces has cost Libya 9 billion US dollars in lost revenue so far this year. The stoppage has become a big obstacle to new efforts to seek a path forward in peace talks after Haftar's assault on Tripoli collapsed in June. Libya and many of its state institutions have been split for years between the internationally recognized government of national accord in Tripoli and Haftar's Libyan National Army in the east. I announced the resumption of production and export of oil with all requirements and necessary procedures to guarantee a fair distribution of oil revenues and to make sure they are not used to support terrorism or are put at risk of theft. We are keen to do this with the aim of improving the living conditions of our people. GNA's Deputy Prime Minister Ahmed Matig issued a statement immediately after Haftar's speech, also saying it had been decided to resume oil production adding that this would involve a new committee to oversee revenue distribution. He said the committee would coordinate between the two sides to prepare a budget and transfer funds to cover payments and deal with the public debt. And in the eastern parts of Libya, Prime Minister of the internationally recognized government, Fayez al-Sarraj, stunned many of his party's supporters when he announced that he would step down at the end of October. That kind of a development, hearing a news like that, of course, upsets us. As you remember, in a place like Libya in Tripoli, with our intervention there, Libya's internationally recognized Prime Minister Fayez al Sarraj and his team were rescued from the approach invasion of General Khalifa Haftar. Al-Sarraj has headed the GNA since it was formed in 2015 as a result of a UN-backed political agreement aimed at uniting and stabilizing Libya after the chaos that followed the 2011 uprising that ousted Muammar Gaddafi. His resignation could add to political uncertainty in Tripoli or even infighting among the rival factions in the coalition that dominates Western Libya. However, it also comes in the context of a renewed push towards a political solution after the GNA in June ended the rival Libyan National Army's 14-month assault on Tripoli and forced it to retreat from the capital. So significant uh, developments taking place in Libya. And for more on this, uh, uh, and this political stalemate, we're now joined by Sami Hamdou, who's the editor-in-chief of the International Interest, uh, a current affairs magazine with a particular focus on the politics of the Middle East. Uh, Sami, always good to talk to you. Um, uh, I wonder if... Um, Al Siraj's uh, um, resignation, uh, saying that the political and social situation in Libya was in a state of severe polarization, making all attempts to reach a political settlement to prevent bloodshed difficult. Is this too much for anybody to solve? I think it's important to look at the context within Siraj mm. has made uh, his uh, announcement. Mm. Uh, first off, it's important to state that he was the head of a transitional government, and GNA was never supposed to last this long. It was supposed to be a body by which it would oversee a transitional period and lead to elections. So Saraj was always expected to resign, even if the question of when was always uh, up for debate. Mm. But the, the issue that we have to understand here is this comes off the back of uh, renewed jostling within Tripoli, renewed jostling amongst the militias, uh, that fight under the banner of the GNA. Saraj will have hoped that the threat of Haftar, the Tripoli offensive, would have uh, shaken the militias and made them realize that they need to cooperate, they need to unify into one body to become an effective body. 
But as soon as the Haftar threat became distant, they went back to uh, 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 jostling with one another, competing uh, with one another. On the international level, Saraj, uh, for want of a better word, uh, has been bullied by Turkey, which has expected uh, rewards uh, for its intervention. And when Saraj was dragging his feet, Turkey made it absolutely clear that it expected tangible rewards and it would not make the same mistake that France did when France bailed out the, the Libyan revolution against Gaddafi. France uh, waited for its rewards. It didn't get any rewards. And that's why it changed sides and decided to back Haftar, who wanted to overthrow the entire political process. Turkey was, uh, was insistent that it wants its rewards, whereas Saraj was insistent on a political process that meant keeping the door open to various different other parties. And that's why we see Erdogan quite upset about this development, because for Turkey, it's not clear if they've managed to create an irreversible situation with regards to their interest. By irreversible, I mean creating a situation such that whoever comes into power after Saraj cannot change the contract signed with Turkey, cannot go back on the agreement of the military bases, whether that's in El Watiya or in uh, Misrata. Uh, and lastly, uh, Saraj is in a bitter feud with his interior minister, Fethi Bashara. Bashara has his own ties. Bashar has his own ties with the international powers, whether that's with France, whether that's with Turkey, uh, whether that's his overtures to Egypt uh, or the like. And indeed, if we look at the Libyan scene, you'll know that individual militias have been pursuing their own foreign policies at the expense of the GNA for a long time. In 2016, Washington allied with Misrata, a particular militia that was supposed to be part of the GNA, but Washington was liaising with it directly under the pretext of fighting terrorism, fighting ISIS uh, in uh, Libya. So in, in the midst of this context and in the midst of this backlash, at Saraj's attempts to centralize power, to assert himself as the leader of the government, in the midst of the resistance from the militias, resistance from the central bank, resistance from the international powers, and the expectant, uh, expectancy from the likes of Turkey that Saraj uh, must do the bidding and must uh, show appreciation for Turkey's intervention, it appears that Saraj has thrown a curveball and said, you know what, guys, I'm going to resign end of October. I'll leave you guys with the mess, and let's see how you handle it. And that's why now we see France establishing new ties with Tripoli militia, uh, Turkey launching overtures to Egypt saying, come, let's cooperate with one another, when just a few months ago it was saying that Egypt uh, is, uh, for, uh, in, in, for want of a better word, is a has-been now uh, on Libya. We see all of these different dynamics changing, and Sarraj, it's all because of Saraj's curveball that he's thrown in the, wind, in the, in, in, in the works. All right. So what could be the consequences? I mean, uh, since 2015, he's been a constant and uh, whatever drama has been playing out, uh, there was this person in the middle of it uh, trying to juggle all these balls. Now he's stepped to one side. What happens next? What could happen next? I think that, that what Saraj is trying to force, Saraj is trying to force a political process. The reason he said end of October is because he's saying to everybody, look, I'm not going to hang around and be a, a lackey for anybody. Now, I'm, I'm ready to do a political process. And that's why what's interesting is that uh, one day after he makes this announcement, Haftar comes out and says, I'm willing to uh, lift some of the oil blockade uh, and allow oil proceeds uh, to go uh, to Tripoli. Uh, of course, there is the dynamic that Haftar wants to assert himself and remind everybody that he can still be a player after his influence has been diminished. But what's significant about today is that Ahmed Maitig, the deputy prime minister, uh, has accepted Haftar's statement, has talked about establishing a joint committee to oversee uh, the oil proceeds. But the devil is in the details. Tripoli, uh, there are reports that Tripoli has agreed to take on the debt of the Eastern government, to take on, and some numbers put that at 40 billion. In other words, that as part of this political process, that the, the winner here is the Eastern government, which suddenly finds itself that now it Tripoli will bear the burden of the debt that it has incurred throughout the period that it's been ruling uh, in the East. But what Saraj wants to do is force a political process. The problem now is uh, everybody is waiting to see what will the reaction of the militias be. Because it's important to understand that they've only ever united when Haftar was attacking them, because, when it was attacking Tripoli, because they knew if Haftar wins, they will all be uh, sidelined uh, from the picture. The problem now is with, with Saraj creating this vacuum, Bashar wants to be king. Other militia leaders want to be king. Everybody's going to try to lobby for that international power in order to be king. And the reason they will go to the international powers is because the Libyan protests uh, highlight and demonstrate without any doubt 
that the Libyan people want to see new faces, that they're tired of this political elite, that they accuse of launching this war and prolonging this war simply for their own sakes at the expense of the Libyan citizen. And that's why what worries many observers is that with Sarraj gone, the, 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 the jostling and the role of the interna international powers is going to increase such that it might alter the balance and result in a stalemate in the political process. Uh, in other words, the ideas of partition, the ideas are, are still on the table. It seems uh, um, that uh, the players are all sort of uh, weighing up the odds and trying to figure out uh, where the chess moves are going next. Could there be another bid for Tripoli by Haftar? We've seen in the east where he controls um, the government there, led by Abdullah Al Thani, resigned on Sunday. Uh, we've seen, it's important to understand that from Haftar's yeah. perspective, uh, his influence has declined significantly since the failure of the Tripoli offensive. And Egypt and Russia have been trying to empower his rival, uh, Aguila Saleh. By taking control of the oil fields, Haftar is trying to use it as a last gasp to say, I'm still relevant, I'm still here. And in fact, one of the reasons why Saraj is so angry is because whereas the US and Germany were trying to put together their own proposal for a political process, and they were ready to uh, abide by Saraj's demand that Haftar not be part of this political process and that he, did, he negotiates with Aguila Saleh instead, Macron, France, in the background, uh, in a true fashion, there's a famous Arabic saying uh, in North Africa, harab. I either play in the game or I ruin it for everyone. So Macron essentially uh, went behind the backs of the US and Germany and insisted on trying to arrange a meeting uh, between Saraj and Haftar without Saraj knowing, mm. inviting Saraj to Paris and forcing him to sit with Haftar in a bid to show some sort of uh, French power and to Im Im impose France uh, once again. So in other words, there are all these different dynamics still at play, in particular France, which still believes that it can use Haftar as a power card, given that it's about to be sidelined and squeezed by Turkey on one side and Russia on the other side. Russia and Egypt are backing Aguila Saleh now. So France is saying, look, I don't want to be sidelined. I am a superpower in my own right. I deserve to be respected, whether that's in the Sahel in Africa, uh, whether that's uh, in uh, negotiations with Iran, whether that's in dealings with Washington. I am king of Europe. Nobody is going to ignore me. If I can't go to Aguila Saleh, if I can't go to Saraj, then I'm going to make sure that Haftar survives. I'm going to make sure that he sits at the table because it's my only chance to be part of the proceedings. And that's why we see Haftar now making okay. these concessions because Haftar is trying to feel that, yes, I still have a supporter and I still have a chance in the game. I still have skin. Sami Hamzi, always great talking to you. I'm sure we're going to have another conversation pretty soon as this situation unfolds. Thanks so much for your insights. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.